Good morning, grade 8 math students. On to a brand new chapter, probability. Okay, so what is probability? You can see my uh, friend here flipping the coin into the piggy bank. Um, before we explain anything or actually do any probability work, I need you to get up out of your chair, go find a coin or a poker chip. I don't care if it's a loony or a toonie or a quarter or whatever. Go find a coin, get yourself a scrap piece of paper. I want you to flip that coin 10 times, and then I want you to write down the results of each of those 10 flips. Go ahead and do that. Pause the video. Go on, go, don't just sit there. Find a coin, get up, go find a coin, pause the video. And unpause. Okay, so you flipped the coin 10 times. I would think that maybe a few of us got five heads and five tails. Um, but for the vast majority of us, I would assume that we did not get those perfect results. Okay, what we need to recognize here is that there's a difference between an experimental probability, like when you flip the coin itself, and a theoretical or calculated probability. We're gonna work mostly with calculated probabilities. Okay, now I hope all of you realize that the odds of flipping a head or a tail on a coin should be half and half. It should be a 50% chance of flipping either of those, right? But if you only flip that coin 10 times, the issue is it's a very small sample space. You're never going to get perfect theoretical results with that tiny of a sample space. However, the more times you do that experiment, like if you flip that coin 100 times or 1,000, 10,000 or 100,000 times, which I won't make you do, although that would be pretty funny, um, your experimental results will get closer and closer to that 50%, that perfect, um, I guess, ideal probability that you would calculate. Okay, so let's look at some uh, terms and what probability actually is. It is the option, the, the odds for us to predict the results of an event. Okay, so like predicting the results of the coin flips. We need to know two things if we're gonna do probability calculations. We need to know how many total possible outcomes there are. So on a coin, it's easy. There's two outcomes. The outcomes are head and tail, right? On a dice, the outcomes are one, two, three, four, five, and six. So if we know how many outcomes there are, we also need to know how likely each one of those outcomes is. Again, on a dice, this is really easy. The outcomes are the same and the amount are the same. There's one head, there's one tail on each coin. On a dice, okay, the probability of rolling any number on a dice is one out of six, one sixth, because they're all the same. There's only one one on a dice. However, think about reaching into a bag of marbles where there are five red marbles and only two blue marbles. You can see that on any given time you pull a marble out, it's much more likely to go to red marble instead of a blue one. Okay, so let's look at some keywords here uh, for probability. The first one obviously is the definition of probability. It's the likelihood or the chance of an event occurring. Independent events, this is a really important term and we're gonna learn all about this today. It's the result for which outcome of one event does not affect the outcome of the next event. So two things, where the first thing doesn't affect the second thing. So let's stick with our coin analogy here. If I flip a coin one time, pick that coin back up and flip it again, the fact that I flipped it already and got a head, let's say, that does not have an effect on the next time I flip the coin. The odds are the exact same of flipping a head or a tail the next time I flip that coin, or if I flip that coin a thousand times. The probability or the chance of getting a head or a tail is the same on every flip. So you would call those events independent. All right, let's move on to a favorable outcome. So that's the thing you're looking for, or a successful result in your probability experiment. So if I wanted the, the favorable outcome of a head, it's one out of two on a coin. Okay, sample space is a list of all the possible outcomes. There's a few different ways to do that. We're gonna use tree diagrams in order to do that today. And finally, simulation is just a word that we use when we do a probability experiment, whether that be a real experiment or in our case, a theoretical one. All right, so let's recognize which of these, in, which of these events on our screen here are independent or not independent events. Now remember for an event to be independent, it cannot affect the next thing in the experiment. They have to be completely separate of each other. All right, so A here. We're gonna do two things in this probability experiment, this simulation. We're gonna spin this spinner and we're gonna flip the quarter. Okay, 
does spinning the spinner have any impact on whether you get a head or a tail on the quarter? If they have no impact on each other, they're independent. If they do impact each other, they're not independent. Let's look at B. We're going to take a marble out of bag A, and then we're going to pick a marble out of bag B. Do you think those are independent or not independent? Example C. Let's remove a marble from this bag this time. We're going to take that marble and stick it in our pocket and keep it. Then, for the second part of this experiment, we're going to take another marble out of the bag. Does the first one affect the second one? And finally, the same bag of marbles for D. But this time, we'll remove a marble from the bag, we'll write down what color it was, we'll put it back in the bag, and then we'll remove another marble from the bag. Is that independent or not independent? Okay, time to check your answers. A was independent. The spinner has nothing to do with the quarter. C over here, the one with the marbles where we take the marble, put it in our pocket, and then we pull another one out. Those are not independent events. Because if you keep a marble you picked in the first trial, there's a different number of marbles in the bag. So those events actually affect each other. Those are not independent. Okay, part B, which is the two different bags of marbles, those are independent events. And that's because whatever you pick in the first bag has absolutely no effect on what you pick out of the second bag. And finally, part D here, picking a marble out of a bag, putting it back in, picking another marble. Those are independent events. The odds are the same. You haven't changed anything. You've written down your response. You've put the marble back in. So the odds that you get that marble are the exact same in the second experiment as they were the first experiment. Okay, let's look at a deck of cards now. Okay, so we've got part A and part B. Um, part A, we're going to take a card out of those five cards on the screen. We're going to keep it. We'll put it in our pocket. And then we'll take another card. Are those independent or not independent? Part B. This time, out of the same five cards, we're going to remove a card, write down our answer. We'll put the card back in. We'll shuffle them again. And then we'll remove another card. Is that non-independent or independent? Here's the answers. Part A, not independent. If you keep the card, the odds are different the next time because there's only four cards instead of five. And the card you picked and kept is no longer available to be picked. So those are not independent events. For B, they are in fact independent events. Because this time you've put the card back and the odds are the same for picking that card or any other card as the first time you pulled a card. Okay, so we're going to look at another example, another simulation here. See the spinner with the pencil and the paper clip? We're going to spin that spinner twice. So two different experiments on the same spinner. Okay, so question A says, what is the probability of spinning an A on the first spin? So right now we're just going to look at the first spin. We're not even worried about that second one. Okay, so the spinner has three equal parts. We've got A, B, and, well, B, the second B. Oh, my goodness. Okay, again, notice that there's one A on there and two Bs. So, the probability of spinning an A, let's say, that's what this question is actually asking for. What is the probability of spinning an A? Well, one section of the spinner, that's where the top of the fraction comes from, out of the bottom. So we have the number of favorable outcomes, that's the one we're looking for, the A, over or divided by the number of total possible outcomes. Well, there's A, there's B, and then there's another B. So there's three possible outcomes. That's where this fraction comes from. So you write this as a capital letter P that's italicized. And then what you're looking for in A in brackets beside it is equal to, well, one out of three. There's a one in three chance we're going to spin an A. Okay, moving on to the, uh, the next question here. Okay, this time we're going to draw a tree diagram to show the sample space. And remember, the sample space is just a way of showing all of the total possibilities of a simulation. So, we've got one spin, 
and a second spin. How do I show what all the possibilities are of those two spins? Well, I do it like this. I draw A, B, and then a second B, because notice the spinner has an A, a B, and another B on it. So A, B, B, that would be my first spin. Then if I spin an A the first time on my second spin, I could spin another A, I could spin a B, or I could spin the other colored B. If I spin a B, let's just say an orange B this time, okay, on the first spin, then I could spin on my second one, an A, a B, or the blue B. On the third one, I could spin a B the first time, this would be the blue B in this case, and then an A, a B, or the other B. So you can see here, I've listed these with commas separating them, and there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine total outcomes. There's nine results that you could get by spinning a three-sided spinner two times. Okay, moving on to part C here. Uh, this time, what's the probability of spinning an A first followed by a B? So we write it as this, the little italicized capital P and then in brackets are favorable outcomes, what we're looking for. So A and then a B, okay? I'm gonna use that exact same tree diagram that I just had, okay? And all I'm going to do is just highlight, and when we do this on paper, I tell my students to circle these, right? Highlight the ones, the favorable outcomes, the thing we're looking for. Look, it happens twice. It's only these baby blue ones. So an A first and a B second, the only two times that happens are right here. So out of the nine possible outcomes, the nine total outcomes, the favorable one, the thing we're looking for only happens two times. So we put that in a fraction, the number of things we're looking for over the total number, and that is two out of nine in this case. And again, if you want to write this as a fraction, this is a perfect answer. If you want to convert that to a decimal, it's just two divided by nine, top divided by bottom. Okay, last question in this example. This time, we're looking for the probability of getting the same letter on both of our spins. So there's two different ways we can do this. We can get an A and then another A, or we can go first spin B and second spin B. So you can see I've got to write two different sets of brackets here. The probability of an A with an A or a B with a B. Then I'm going to use the same outcome table that I've already got written down, and I'm just going to circle, or in this case, highlight orange, all of the times that those favorable, favorable outcomes come up on my spinner. So you can see here, I can have an A and an A, I can have a B and a B, another B and a B, a B and a B, and a B and a B, depending on which order I've done those Bs in. Okay? So how do I write this? Well, I've got it down here, just like in the question, that happens one two, three, four, five times out of nine total possibilities. Five over nine as a fraction is a perfectly reasonable answer. You could also convert that to a decimal or into a percent. All right, that's a lot of me talking for today. I want you to practice this now. So uh, in your notebook, please complete the practice questions. Uh, also, do the textbook practice questions outline there. That's page 416, numbers 3, 4, and 12. Uh, the answers are in the content library, and they're under, uh, they're under week 6, lesson 1, if you want to find the answers. Thank you very much. Uh, don't be afraid to go back through this video. I'll also post the slides. Uh, good luck. Please chat up Miss Mearhead and myself if you need any help. Thank you.